Shall we bow head for a word of prayer? Father God, as we come to worship you this morning, we would like to invite you to dwell and to be with us from wherever we may be, both in this place and from wherever we are watching the live streaming service right now. And thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to allow us to worship you. And this is our prayer, for we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
And uh, for the scripture reading today uh, is uh, taken from uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And that's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And uh, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Amen. Good morning and blessed Sabbath to all of us. And this morning, I just would like to tell you that I would like to ask all of us to pray together because actually halfway through of this week, I changed my sermon topic, feeling that there is the need for us to explore this verse that just being read just now. So before we enter into the time for us to explore the Word of God, I would like to invite us to bow ahead for prayer. Father God, as we come to explore this verse that is often time being used, but may not necessarily what we have, what your intention to express this word for us. So help us, Lord, to be able to take whatever message that we are going to take right now for the sake of our spiritual growth and to know that we are able to hear your word more clearly when we understand the full message all together. So bless us, Lord, because we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, during this time of the pandemic, many times I received this verse that was read just now on my WhatsApp and even Facebook or even any other social media. And I think many of us may have received the same verse as well. And this verse has been quoted many times as the way to encourage people when they were not in a very good situation. So when you hear this verse, or when you read it together, it is indeed a very encouraging verse. It's said in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. We like to send this verse to the people that are struggling, or when we want them to be encouraged by the Word of God. And I think there is nothing wrong about sending encouraging message to each other, especially when it comes to the Word of God itself. But we may need to have this perspective. When we send these encouraging messages, we need to understand that for every message that comes from the Word of God, there is always this question that we need to ask. What message is the writer of this text actually would like to convey? Because oftentimes, we may interpret the Bible from the way we want the Bible to speak on behalf of us. But you and I know and you and I believe that the Word of God is not coming from us. Whatever spoken by the Word must be spoken by the Word itself. And so when it comes, when it comes to this verse, we need to ask this question as well. When Paul which we believe the writer of the book of Corinthians would like to extend this message to his first reader or to the church of Corinth of his time, what actually was inspired by the Holy Spirit in his mind that he wants to read, that he wants to write this text. And so in order for us to understand, we need to look upon the text the way it should be. And so today, I would like to invite you together to open our Bible in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We will explore this verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, from the way Paul intended it to be. Because when we take the verse independently from the things that are written in between the text that we read, we will come to a very misleading interpretation. Because 
context or what surrounds the text that you quote in order for, uh, for when we are sending this message to each other indeed are very important. We cannot interpret a verse without considering the surrounding statements of the whole passage because it can lead into misinterpretation. When we read a letter from the public or when we read a message from the government or when we read our newspaper, we don't just quote a specific statement there without considering the context surrounding it. And it, the same principle should be applied to the Word of God. It is not something wrong that the Bible was designed in such a way that it consists chapter and verses. But in the original text, when Paul wrote the letter to the church of Corinth, he doesn't use or he doesn't put any chapter and verses inside. It is a complete letter in which the reader must read from the very beginning of the letter to the end of the letter in order for them to understand the full message of Paul. It is because the church way back through the history would like to encourage people to read the Bible more that the verses and the chapters were in introduced to the text in the Bible. And therefore, when we read the Bible, especially when we read letters such as 1 Corinthians, we have to realize that from the beginning of the letter till the end, Paul would like to speak about a specific message that need to be read in the whole context. And so as we look upon this context of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we will ask this question, so what is the context of that verse? What is the context of that verse about temptation? And as we look together, it started with this statement in the first verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and that is when Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. It is a statement of warning. So Paul actually started this passage not so much about encouraging them, but rather to give this warning that, hey, take a look upon these circumstances that you may fall into. And after this statement, Paul followed by this statement on the first four verses of the chapter that said, all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses, in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. And so Paul would like to portray a certain society, a certain condition of the people, a certain way of people doing things or being blessed by something that this warning need to be taken very seriously. And so afterward, the question comes, why did Paul talk about the Israelites? And he mentioned in details all the privileges that the Israelites enjoy as they march towards the Promised Land. Paul would like to say that the Israelites back then and the church of Corinth of his time has these similarities that they were under a lot of privileges. They were blessed, they were prospered, they were protected, their life was comfortable, and they actually enjoy peace and comfort. For those of us who studied the history of the New Testament era, the city of Corinth was a metropolis like Singapore today. It was a rich, wealthy city. It was the center of trade of the ancient New Testament time. It is the place where all the things that run from businesses to medicine to science to education and to all types of activities happens in the city. The people were very comfortable. The people are not struggling from any form of persecutions yet. They enjoy the peace and comfort of this city. And so Paul would like to remind them that Church of Corinth, 
You are enjoying such wonderful privileges. You are blessed by the Lord. You are enjoying such peaceful circumstances. But be careful. Because these privileges does not necessarily mean that you are in favor by God. Because after, uh, after elaborating on the blessing that the city of the church of Corinth enjoys, then Paul said, But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. He would like to tell the, city of, the church in the city of Corinth that despite all the blessings, all the favor, all the privileges, all the things that the Israelites received in their time, and that the city, the church in Corinth also received, it is not a sign that God was happy with them. Many of them died and perished through the journey that they went from Egypt to the Promised Land. And as we look upon this text, it is an important question that we need to ask ourselves as well. Is God pleased with us? Now, you and I enjoy very similar circumstances with the people who are staying in the city of Corinth. Singapore is well known to be one of the wealthiest cities in the world. We enjoy security, we enjoy privilege, we enjoy peace, and we enjoy all the facilities and infrastructure that we find very conveniently provided for us here in this city. I just asked my sister in Indonesia. She's currently living in a city called Surabaya. And in Indonesia, because of the, of the size of the country, they have to set a specific zone for everyone to know whether they are entering into a zone where the COVID-19 cases are increasing. So we have three zones in Indonesia. The red zone, the yellow zone, and the green zone. And so I asked her yesterday, so which zone you are in? And she said, we have this joke, and we are actually in watermelon zone. Now, what does it mean, watermelon zone? I said, I asked, what do you mean by watermelon zone? You see watermelon? Outside, it's green, but inside, it's red. And so he's living in between this red and green zone. Their house is located on the green zone where it's pretty safe. But the workplace of her husband and the center of activities for them are located at the red zone. And so they said, she said to me, they are in the watermelon zone. Outside are green, but inside was red. But in Singapore, we do not have to be so concerned about this. The daily report, as you have read on the newspaper, always indicate that the community cases are on a very, very low number. There are many days where it's basically zero, both in the dormitory and in the community. The majority of cases today are basically imported cases from overseas. We don't have to worry about whether we are on the red zone, yellow zone, or green zone. We are all feeling the joy of being able to walk out and being more active, knowing that there is no risk, or the risks are very small for us to contract the virus, because basically in the community, the control is very, very strong. But the question goes back to the, to the one that is being displayed right now. After all these privileges and blessings that we received, is God pleased with us? Because oftentimes we may have this idea, simply because our life has been very, very blessed, that God is in favor of us. But it is not necessarily true, based upon the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that we may enjoy all these privileges, but we are not favored by God. But let's move on fast to the text itself, because then we need to ask this question. What actually the temptation that Paul speaks about in this chapter. And so there are four main temptations in which the Israelites were failings to do, that they were not able to, be a to enter into the promised land and they perish as they travel to Canaan. 
The first one was that they, they failed to overcome the temptation of idolatry. It was written in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7. Then they, were, they failed to overcome the temptation of fornication on verse 8. Then they failed to, they failed to overcome the temptation that they're testing God by, by being ungrateful towards the blessing of manna that they receive each and every day. It was mentioned in, on verse 9. And then finally, on verse 10, the Bible mentioned that one temptation that they also failed to do is they are continually complaining to God through Moses. These are the four temptations that the Israelites failed to be aware of they were not vigilant enough to overcome these temptations that many of them perish during their journey towards the promised land. That they could not stay faithful to God and do not worship any other God along the way. They were not able to handle their lust that they fall into the sin of fornication. They were ungrateful to God that they are testing God and they are complaining to God and God has to give them this stern and difficult discipline. And the question that we need to ask ourselves, why that the last one, that the temptation of complaining were mentioned in the text? Is complaining that serious that Paul has to write in his passage, in this letter to the city of the church in the city of Corinth, that be careful of your complaining attitude. Otherwise, you may not be able to see the promised land that Jesus has promised us as well. Is complaining that serious? I mean, for many of us who are reading this text, you may see that, okay, yeah, idolatry is totally bad. I mean, this is a very bad uh, sin. Fornication, yes, definitely, we frown upon those who are living in unhealthy sexual behavior everywhere. We condemn those who commit adultery very seriously. And being ungrateful, well, it's about personality and attitude. But complaining, I, I'm not allowed to complain. I'm not allowed to express my concern. I'm not allowed to say something about something that I think is not right. Why does Paul literally mentioned that there are four sins that lead the Israelites to perish on the wilderness, one of them includes the form of complaining. And as we look upon the text, we need to explore where this expression comes from. And the quotation of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, was taken from the story of Numbers chapter 16. So now I would like to invite every one of you to flip your Bible or to scroll your Bible from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 to Numbers chapter 16. In this chapter, this is the story about the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram against Moses and Aaron. In that passage, as you skim through with me right now, you will notice that these three men were not only influential, they were the Levites, which is a, a, a special group of people dedicated to be the caretaker of the temple. And so, they are considered today as church leaders. They are your elders. They are your deacons. They are your ministry leaders. They are those people who are working for the Lord. Now, back then, there is no salaried workers. Everyone is simply serving for the Lord in different capacities. And so we look upon them, and as we explore, they have this statement against Moses. They said they came as a group. That is a very interesting uh, details that the Bible intentionally would like to mention there. They came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far. The whole community is holy, every one of them and the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourself above the Lord's assembly? So first of all, they do not come alone. They do not want to express their concern face to face directly to Moses. The book of Numbers chapter 16 verse 3 said, they came as the group. 
So they gang up some support, they come and gather together, and then they go and oppose Moses. And then the second statement being mentioned there, they said, you have gone too far. They start to see that Moses', Moses leadership are not the way they expect him to be. And then the whole community, now they start to say that we are more correct than you. We are better in our judgment than you. The whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. And they claim that they are representing the true voice of God. And then the final accusation came to Moses. Why then do you set yourself above the Lord's assembly? In a simple street word today, they would like to tell Moses, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Do you think that you are better than us? Do you think that you are the leader appointed by God to lead us? Who do you think you are? And as you look upon the book of Numbers chapter 16, Moses immediately fell down and put his face on the ground for he felt such attack that is very, very personal. And the story goes that God assured Moses that he is the one that has been appointed by God to lead the people. And God was very upset with the rebellion of these three leaders together with their supporters in going against Moses and calling him, who do you think you are? We do not want to listen to you. We are here not to follow your instruction. You are nobody to us. We are all just as good as, who you, are, as you are. We are all here as just as blessed are, as you are. And there is no right for you to tell us what to do. And God was so upset with these three leaders that God said, separate them and I will make sure, I will show who am I and who you are as my appointed leader. And that day, as you look upon the book of Numbers chapter 16, thousands of them perish, being swallowed by the, by the ground because of their rebellion against Moses and Aaron. But the concerning thing is the story afterward. Even after the whole nation witnessed the presence and the power of God towards those who are going and express their unhappiness in this way, the verse mentioned that in the book of Numbers chapter 16, verse 41, the next day, the whole Israelites' community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. You have killed the Lord's people. Imagine that. They have witnessed the power of God. They have witnessed that God has taken away the people that has rebelled against Him and His leadership. And yet, the strength of that mindset that Moses and Aaron are not deserving to be their leader was so strong that they still complain and say that, well, you have killed an innocent man. God has destroyed an innocent group of people. And they throw this blame to Moses. They say to Moses, Moses that you have killed the Lord's people. Was it Moses' hand that has destroyed Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? No. Was it Moses' decision that they have to be perished because of their rebellion? No. But they throw the blame. They throw the accusation. They accuse God's appointed leader as the source of the trouble that now they received. And because of this, God sent another destruction in the form of a plague. And that's why in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, because of their complaining, God sent the destroyer. Or in your version, God sent some form of force to take away the people. It is referring to this plague that was sent to those who are expressing their unhappiness and their rebellion against Moses and his leadership. Now, as we look upon this passage, now the verse 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, comes in a bit different picture, isn't it? This is not about just any temptations that we are facing. 
This is not about while you're walking towards your house and halfway through, there is McDonald's along the way. And you are tempted to eat something less healthier than what you need to eat for your body. It is not about being tempted of just any single things in life. But rather, as you look upon the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul would like to remind us that there are four very dangerous temptations that we may easily fall if we are not aware of it. This passage was not the way of Paul or I plan to do today to say that we need to silence criticism. It is not the way for me to say that you are not allowed to complain. It is not the way for, me, for the passage to be used in this context of trying to close any form of dialogue to improve anything that happens, whether it's in the ministry, whether it's in the family, whether it's in the church, or whether it's in the form of any things that happens in our spiritual life. But I, I like this idea that is also being mentioned in the Bible, that what is wrong with them today, what was wrong, what went wrong with them that day, it is not so much about the complaining itself, but the spirit behind the complaining. The first one was that the trio thought that they were right, that they are not the one that need to listen to Moses, that they have the right to go against Moses. Who, do you think, who, does, who does Moses think he is? And they started to gather supporters and incite unhappiness. And it is such a dangerous circumstances that any one of us can fall into the same temptation. That when we do not enjoy, that we, when we have something against someone else, that when we have something against our brother and sister, we also go through the spirit of Korah, Dayton, and Abiram, where we start to gather supporters, when we start to gather all the same people who has the same mind, and we start to play the politics, and then finally we launch that rebellion. And as you look upon the story of first on the book of Numbers chapter 16, they were perceived so right that even when God punished them, their followers still thought Moses had persecuted them. How many times in our own personal spiritual journey that we also going through this martyr complex? when we have disagreement with others, when we have different perspective from others, we felt that we are the one being persecuted. We are the one who is being bullied. We are the one who is righteous, and therefore people bully us, forgetting that we need to reflect upon the book of Numbers chapter 16 and ask the question, are we really being bullied? Or it is simply our stubbornness, it is simply our heart, 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 that is so hardened that we are not willing to realize that we are going against God even though we have been warned over and over again that such position and circumstances may lead us to going against God and His people. It is a powerful reminder for us that this verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, was mentioned in this context of temptation. And that is why probably this quote is very interesting for us to remember. That the most dangerous temptation are those temptations that we don't think is a temptation at all. Isn't it? That is the most dangerous temptation. Because the moment when you think certain things are not temptation, you will lo lower your guard. You will lower your defenses. You will think that everything will be okay. You will think that it's normal to do so. Because when we are alert, when we know that temptation is coming, when we know that we can fall into that temptation, we will keep our guard high. We will make sure that we are protected. We will surrender our heart to God. We will make sure that we will not fall. And we will claim the promise of grace of God, that His grace is sufficient for us to go through that temptation. But when we perceive that the things that happens are not temptation at all, it is where temptation became very, very dangerous because we don't think it is a temptation 
at all. And therefore, as I come to Singapore 13 years ago, I realized that this temptation of complaining can be very, very rampant in our place. Because one person, and this person is a Singaporean, by the way, he said that complaining is a national sport in Singapore. If there is an event or there is a, there is a slot on Sea Games or Asian Games where complaining will be the competition, Singapore will always get the gold medal. Because it seems like we complain over everything. When the train breaks down, we complain. When the train slows down, we complain. When the train has train, uh, tried its best, we still complain. When the things are so-so, we complain. When the things get better, we still complain. It seems like this culture of complaining is so rampant, we don't realize that we may fall into the temptation that Paul has remind the city of Corinth and probably remind us today that we need to be very, very vigilant and be careful about it. That if we continue to nurture the spirit of complaining, the spirit of murmuring, the spirit of critical way of thinking, we may not realize that we have neglect the message of the Word of God clearly being mentioned by Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. That if we don't be vigilant about this, we may fall into the same problem that has let the Israelites perish in their journey to the promised land. Because why? The spirit of complaining as we have looked upon it are very dangerous. If we put ourselves in a position where we think we are always right, where we think we are always correct, and it is our job to complain, we may fall into that temptation that will lead us into destruction. The Word of God, as we have looked upon it today, it is a very sharp word both for you and for me. Because to be honest with all of you, I'm also a chronic complainer. I'm not trying to say that this is about you and you and you and you. And forgetting that I also maybe fall into the same problem. Yes, I am. There are times when I think that I'm being very critical. When I think I complain more than what I'm being grateful for. And this message is also a reminder for me that every one of us are growing together by grace. To be honest with all of you, when I come over about 13 years ago, I have so many things that I would like to complain about. I'm not used to the culture where people just can, can come to church anytime they want. Because I'm growing up in a church culture where people are really coming on time because they respect God. And if they say, if I can come on time to see my boss, I must come earlier to see the boss of the universe. But when I come over here, things are very different. Oftentimes, when we look upon the way we treat God, I was very shocked as well when I come over here and I start to see that people like to give their second-hand things to the church. Because in my mindset, aren't we supposed to give the best to the Lord? not some pre-used items that we don't have any place to dispose them. So, give it to the house of God. Give it to the church. And we say at the same time, we love God and we love His people and we are worshipping Him in this place. But yet, when it comes to giving the best for Him, whatever that is pre-used, things that are being replaceable in my house and I cannot put it anywhere else, but I feel guilty of disposing it, give it to the church. And I was very shocked because for me, we are supposed to give the best to the Lord. If you would like to give something, it must be brand new. Because isn't that the way we respect God who has given us life and providence each and every day? But I couldn't accept it and I start to complain. And I start to realize that am I falling into the same problem of being a complainer? Instead of allowing people to grow by grace of God, 
to give them room to realize that, hey, I'm sinners as sinners as you are. And let us grow together as one, to love one another the way it should be. There are times when I'm very uncomfortable where, with the way we do our worship. But then this message reminds me once again, am I also being part of the problem? That I also as chronic complainer as everyone else. And today I would like to bring us into this attention that we may need to look upon this verse differently. Because in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 and 12, it said, Now all these things happen to them as examples. So you and I can learn from it. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. The examples of the Israelites is the lesson that you and me need to learn together. It is because you and I who are living at the end time, just like what Paul mentioned there, upon whom the ends of the ages have come, we need to be very vigilant in protecting ourselves into falling from these four temptations being mentioned in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It is a sacred calling for you and me to start to be more aware. Do I still stick into certain idolatry that I'm yet to let go? And is my life still being tempted into living an unhealthy relationship with certain people that are not according to the Bible? Am I not being grateful to the blessing of God that despite the fact that He has given me manna each and every day, I still feel ungrateful about it? And do I harbor the spirit of complaining that I do not even aware of it and I may fall into the temptation not knowing that it is a serious sin in the eyes of the Lord? I pray that as we look upon this chapter, and now as we look upon this verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, now you may realize that this verse come with this picture behind the sins. This was the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. That that verse was an encouragement of Paul for whoever reading it to know that there is no temptation greater than what we can handle. Means what? You and I can overcome idolatry. You and I can overcome fornication. You and I can overcome ungratefulness. And you and I can overcome the spirit of complaining. So every time you and I will read this verse, please not only remember the verse, but remember the four temptations being mentioned in the whole passage. And the question that we would like to ask, and the last question that I would like to ask every one of us today, are you tempted? Are you tempted right now to start to bow down to another God? Are you tempted right now to start a, living that, a life that is not according to the biblical guidance of relationship? Are you tempted right now to be ungrateful to God? And finally, are you tempted to complain? I bring all this message in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Shall we rise as we come to the benediction? Father God, Lord, this world are filled with many temptations. But there are temptations that we may not be aware because we did not think that it was a temptation. So as we depart from this place today, may your blessing will be with us as we claim our salvation in the death of Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit will continue to remind us that, Lord, the coming of your Son are very near, and we need to be more vigilant, we need to be more careful, and we need to be more aware that we may not fall into temptation. Lord, we are all sinful human beings. Without your power, we cannot do so. So please do not leave us, and may this blessing will be with us as we depart from this church right now. So this is our prayer, Lord, for we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.